On this Wednesday night, no mercy for a mass murderer. The Toronto van attacker guilty on all 26 counts. He took lives and he didn't care. The judge's ruling and the relief. Canada's COVID-19 vaccine rollout, the Prime Minister's more optimistic timeline, and the next provinces to delay the second dose. Bidding wars and big profits, why Canada's two most expensive housing markets just got hotter. Mystery in the air. Would you hop on a flight without knowing where it's going? Plus, risky rescue mission. You can imagine you're playing darts, except the dartboard is moving, and you have to hit bullseyes, and it's in the dark. A burning boat, dozens of lives at stake, and a race against time. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with a verdict in a horrific case of a mass murder in Toronto. Nearly three years after the driver of a van deliberately slammed into pedestrians on a busy sidewalk, he has been found guilty of murdering these people. Ten counts of first-degree murder and 16 counts of attempted murder. It happened April 23, 2018, on Toronto's Young Street. The man convicted today had rented a van and plowed into pedestrians. The judge said he planned to kill as many people as possible. One of those who survived is Catherine Riddell. It's not closure, and it's not, like, I'm not happy. I don't feel like dancing, but I feel like justice has been done. And... And it's a relief off my shoulders that we have finally got this trial done. In her ruling today, Justice Malloy dismissed the defense argument that the accused was not criminally responsible, saying he knew it was wrong to kill people. He chose to commit the crimes anyway, because it was what he really wanted to do. This was the exercise of free will, she said, by a rational brain capable of choosing between right and wrong. Why did he do it? The judge concludes there were multiple factors, but the bottom line, he did it to become famous. Because of that, the judge did not name him in her verdict today, referring to him instead as John Doe, saying that media coverage is exactly what this man sought from the start. Eric Sorensen has our top story tonight. What was he thinking? The act seemed senseless, mindless. Yet it was also planned and deliberate. From the moment an arrest was made and for the next three years, questions revolved around the state of mind of this mass murderer. I honestly don't know what I would say. The man who had nothing to say to the families of the people he killed turned to a defense claiming a mental disorder caused by his autism. During a virtual trial, psychiatrists debated whether he was criminally responsible. In the end, Judge Anne Malloy was persuaded Alec Manassian made a rational choice to kill. His attack on these 26 victims that day was an act of a reasoning mind, notwithstanding its horrific nature, she said, and notwithstanding that he has no remorse for it and no empathy for his victims. The verdict, guilty of all 10 murder charges and all 16 of attempted murder of those injured. With first-degree murder, he faces a life sentence with no eligibility for parole for 25 years. For families of the victims, an enormous weight finally lifted. It's like you're holding your breath for three years and you can finally breathe. Rocco D'Amico lost his daughter. We still, we're always going to miss her. I, I don't know how you adjust to her. Kathy Riddell was run down that day and has no memory of it. He can spend the rest of his life in jail because he deserves it. I'm sorry he took, he took lives and he didn't care. A verdict other than guilty would have shocked the legal community and most Canadians. The Crown is pleased with Her Honour's thoughtful and reasonable verdict and grateful for Her Honour's careful assessment of the evidence. The man responsible was told of the verdict by his lawyer, but Boris Bytansky had no response from him. Certainly this uh, outcome was, was one that was contemplated as, as being uh, entirely plausible. It was an important verdict for autism advocates. Many outraged that autism spectrum disorder was used as a defense. In terms of the erroneous perception that having autism is, uh, is, is somehow akin to criminality in terms of lack of capacity to make good judgment, and, um, and that's just wrong. Eight of the ten people rammed and killed that day were women, and Marie D'Amico's family started a foundation in her name. As it relates to having women and children live free of violence, I think, I think it's a big step forward for us. A harrowing chapter in the city's history also brings recollections of the heroes that day, the police and other first responders, and the ordinary citizens who helped. And for those who suffered most, today brings some measure of satisfaction. I probably will sleep tonight for the first time in a while. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. 
The judge today made a point of naming the people she calls the true heroes of the day. They include Toronto Police Constable Ken Lamb. Constable Lamb was the officer who single-handedly confronted the perpetrator after the van stopped. Lamb said afterwards he was just doing his job, but it was his composure and professionalism that made headlines around the world. This is how it played out. Constable Lamb shouts at the suspect to get down. He is pointing something that looks like a gun. And twice gestures as if he's pulling something from his pocket. Watch Constable Lamb react. He calmly walks to his cruiser and turns off the siren. The siren now silent, he advances, gun drawn. Then listen to this exchange. Constable Lamb does not shoot, even when the suspect advances, trying to provoke him to open fire. In the end, the man drops what he's holding and gives up without a single shot fired. Police forces around the world took note of how Constable Lamb de-escalated that tense situation and it's considered a great teaching tool. Now to Ottawa and some contradictory evidence at a defense committee hearing examining allegations of inappropriate behavior by former Chief of the Defense Staff General Jonathan Vance. A key question is what did Defense Minister Harjit Sajjan know and when? Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson broke this story about the allegations against Vance. And Mercedes, a former military ombudsman appeared before the committee today. What did he say? Well, Donna, he says that he approached the Minister of National Defense with serious allegations of sexual misconduct against the former Chief of the Defense Staff, General Jonathan Vance, three years ago on March 1st of 2018. He says that he was so concerned by what he saw, he thought the minister should know. But listen as he describes to what the minister refused to accept as what he called uh, incontrovertible and concrete evidence of that sexual misconduct. I reached into my pocket to show him the evidence I was holding, and he pushed back from the table, said no, and I don't think we exchanged another word. I did offer to shake his hand at the end of the meeting and said, please, do get back to me with some advice to tell me what I should do with this. Donna, Minister Sajjan is a former homicide investigator and police officer, so the news that he pushed back from the table as the former ombudsman alleges and refused to look at this evidence is significant. It also contradicts what the minister has publicly said about becoming aware of these allegations in the press. Global News is aware of the evidence that was in that envelope, according to multiple sources. It was the email chain we previously reported between the previous chief of the defense staff and a then-corporal propositioning her allegedly to go to a clothing optional beach. Now, when we look at all of this, the question is what more could have been done? And the ombudsman says the defense minister didn't do nearly enough in his opinion. Here's what he had to say about that. This was tossed like a hot potato. I think there were a multitude of options available. Uh, discussion, the minister could have met with the victim. That may have been a possibility. The victim may have filed a, a formal complaint. He, I'm sure, had more options than I had. Mercedes, what does this mean then for the defense minister and for the prime minister? Well, people are questioning whether he can stay on. If a government that presents itself as feminist and saying we believe women refuse to look at somebody's allegations uh, in that envelope and refuse to, to actually have a look at them and do something, although he did email the Privy Council office, that was it. We asked the Prime Minister's office tonight if they still have confidence in the minister, and this is what they said. Of course the Prime Minister has confidence in the minister. We also asked Minister Sajjan's office about this just before we went to air. They got back to us saying that he disagrees with parts of the testimony at committee and that he was shocked as everyone else was when those allegations became public last month through Global News. Donna? All right, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thank you. Canada got another boost today to the COVID-19 vaccine supply. Five days after Health Canada approved it for use, the first doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine are on Canadian soil. 500,000 doses arrived early this morning from the Serum Institute of India. With that now added to the vaccine arsenal, the government says it is on track to exceed its target of 6 million doses by the end of this month. And the Prime Minister said today the promised target of getting everyone in Canada vaccinated by the end of September could be moved up.
we're seeing some of the science shift, some uh, proposals put forward, uh, which are very, very interesting, which could result in uh, rapider timelines. It's possible those timelines move forward, uh, but we're going to base those decisions on, uh, on the science. There is a major development tonight on the official guidance over delaying giving the second dose. The National Advisory Committee on Immunizations has now approved a plan to delay the second dose by four months so more people can get at least one dose sooner. The committee said evidence from the last two months shows there is a high level of protection after the first dose. And because of limited supply right now, regions should get the first dose to as many people as possible. Many provinces, including B.C., Manitoba, Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador, have already adopted the plan. Even with the promising vaccine news, the government warns it is still too soon to let up on public health restrictions and support for struggling businesses. It is extending the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy and the Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy until June. That extension is expected to cost an additional $16 billion. Well, after months of tough restrictions, there is some relief in sight for people in Quebec. The premier says more parts of that province will move from the red alert level to orange next Monday. That means the start of the curfew will be pushed to 9.30 p.m. instead of 8 p.m. And restaurants can reopen with strict limits in place. The changes will not apply, though, to the greater Montreal region. The premier says it will remain in the red zone for now. In the U.S., President Biden now says there will be enough vaccine for all American adults to get it by the end of May. And some governors are acting as if the pandemic is over, lifting restrictions and ending mask mandates, even though the U.S. Centers for Disease Control warns it is too early to be so confident. Jackson Prosco reports. Life looks back to normal in Texas. I'm excited. <laughs> like, I'm excited not to have a mask on. The governor suddenly lifted the state's mask mandate and told businesses they can reopen fully. It is now time to open Texas 100%. And yet Texas continues to average more than 7,500 new cases per day. Every one of those worrying virus variants is circulating there. The Lone Star State is at the back of the pack for vaccinations, 48th out of 50 epidemiologists are rattled. I think it's important for people to realize that the, the virus is still out there at pretty high levels um, and there's still a risk at getting infected and causing a surge of a third wave. Good afternoon. But Mississippi has followed suit and dozens of other states are starting to loosen restrictions too. The last thing we need is the Neanderthal thinking that in the meantime everything's fine, take off your mask, forget it. It still matters. <laughs> With thousands of Americans still dying every day, the Centers for Disease Control warns there are troubling signs. Cases have declined from their winter peak, but they're still high and rising again. The B117 hypertransmissible variant looms ready to hijack our successes to date. The next month will prove critical as those virus variants become dominant and as tens of millions of Americans are vaccinated, a race against time. Where there's bad news, there's also good. The Biden administration has announced that it will have enough vaccine available for every American by the end of May. That's two full months ahead of schedule, leading to the possibility of a summer in the U.S. that not only looks normal, but actually is. Donna. Hi, right, Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thanks. China's ambassador to Canada gave a rare press conference today in Ottawa and made a lot of bold claims. He talked about the detention of the two Michaels, as well as reports of genocide being committed against Muslim Uyghurs in the country. Our chief political correspondent David Aiken reports on what the ambassador said and the reaction. China has secured a complete victory in the fight against poverty. That was just one of several incredulous statements made by Chinese Ambassador Kong Peiwu during an hour-long video press conference Wednesday. He would make more incredible claims, saying, for example, that the arrest of the two Michaels and other Canadians was not in retaliation for the arrest of Chinese telecom executive Meng Wanzhou. There is no connection between these cases. They are totally different in nature. Nonsense, says Canada's Prime Minister. No. It is obvious uh, that the two Michaels were arrested on trumped-up national security charges. Chinese officials at the time were very clear that they absolutely uh, were connected as, uh, as a frame. As for the vast region in northwest China known as Xinjiang, 
Canada's parliament has concluded China is engaging in a genocide to destroy the 20 million Muslim Uyghurs who live in that region. But Kong said everyone there is living what he called a happy life. Allegations of genocide and the forced labor in Xinjiang are the lies of the century. Trudeau was not buying that line either. We have uh, and will continue to take very seriously the very credible reports of human rights re abuses uh, in, uh, in Xinjiang, uh, in China, perpetrated against the Uyghurs by the Chinese state. Uh, there are significant uh, concerns uh, being expressed all around the world. Ambassador Kong's goal seemed clear, to tell Canadians that Canada is perpetuating lies about China. In fact, Canada's Prime Minister, its Parliament, and its allies, including the United States, say that when it comes to the two Michaels case or the Uyghur genocide, it is China spreading falsehoods and lies. Donna? All right, David Aiken in Ottawa, thanks. It's a seller's dream. Coming up, why homes are going like hotcakes in two of Canada's priciest real estate markets. Plus, the deadliest day yet in Myanmar's protests against the military coup. There has been lots of economic pain during this pandemic, but what has continued to grow are house prices in some of Canada's biggest cities. Robin Gill looks at what's fueling Canada's two hottest real estate markets. A Vancouver condo listed at just under $900,000 sold in six days. Jason Feinstadt was the listing agent. My phone was ringing off the hook. I probably had about 65 private showings, and then that turned into 15 offers. It sold over asking. Sanity seems to be prevailing. Despite bidding wars, Colette Gerber with Vancouver's Real Estate Board says the prices aren't going to skyrocket. Yes, of course, over time they will go up, but double digit increases, not on the calendar. In February, there was a 73.3% increase in home sales in Vancouver compared to 2020. The benchmark or median price for homes is just over a million dollars. That's a 6.8% increase over a year ago. Low interest rates, more money in the bank and short supply all factors driving the market, but economist Brian Yu doesn't think it'll last. Any growth of this type of nature is sustainable. I think that we are probably hitting a little tipping point. In the greater Toronto area, it's a similar real estate story. In February, there was a 52.5% increase in home sales compared to 2020. The average price, over a million dollars, up 14.9% from a year ago. Our baseline forecast is to see about 10% growth in the average selling price uh, for, for 2021. We're actually you know, above that mark right now. On the whole, we do expect to see double digit price growth in, in, in home prices this year in the GTA. Feinstadt doesn't see the demand diminishing in Vancouver, which is too bad for his buyers. It can be pretty discouraging when, again, you're going up against 14 other offers. What a difference a year makes. Before the pandemic, sales were dropping. The economics of supply and demand are clearly at play in 2021. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. Flying blind ahead, an Australian airline attempts to boost domestic tourism. There was more bloodshed in the streets of Myanmar's biggest cities today. Security forces killed at least 38 people protesting the military coup, the deadliest day since the military seized control of the country early last month. The escalating crackdowns aren't deterring the demonstrators. They are demanding democracy be restored and for leader Aung San Suu Kyi to be released from detention. Australian airline Qantas has come up with a novel way to encourage people to get on board and travel within the country. Starting tomorrow, Australians can book so-called mystery flights. You buy a ticket, board in Brisbane, Sydney or Melbourne and within two hours land somewhere. You just don't know where until you get there. Qantas flew similar mystery flights in the 1990s and last year it offered a seven hour sightseeing flight to nowhere, which sold out. Disaster averted next, the rescue mission off the coast of Nova Scotia. There are few rescues more dangerous than attempting to save people aboard a sinking boat in the open ocean at night 
in rough seas. One of those rescues happened off the coast of Nova Scotia last night. It involved 31 fishermen, rescue crews from two countries, and some brave and steady work. Ross Lord has the story. The final four crew members are removed from the Atlantic Destiny Scallop Trawler, the end of a treacherous attempt to save 31 men. I can imagine you're playing darts, except the dartboard is moving and you have to hit bullseyes and it's in the dark and you're running around the entire time instead of being stationary as you throw. The Atlantic Destiny was fishing about 220 kilometers south of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia at George's Bank. At 8.20 p.m. there was a distress call from the trawler about a fire in the engine room. A fire suppression system kicked in, but the boat lost power. Waves were rolling to eight meters high. Vicious winds gusting to almost 100 kilometers an hour. The crew couldn't stop water from flooding in. At one point, there was even a flare-up of the fire, compounding an emergency that could easily have ended in tragedy. Canadian and American search and rescue technicians teamed up to save lives. The hoisting area was probably like a four by eight section of the uh, on the stern on the right side on the starboard side so it was uh, it was a really tight spot to be able to get the basket down you just think about all the different things that could happen um, you know we, we we get a guy in the basket and maybe we smash him into the boat by accident or the cable gets caught on something their bravery inspired the survivors the guys cheering um, like yeah you got another one uh, so that that that's it's good to hear from them they're in good spirits and they're definitely happy that they're off the boat safe with no injuries the atlantic destiny on the other hand has sunk its owners hope insurance will cover that loss number one is our people got off we can we can replace a boat you can't replace lives ross lord global news Amazing story. That is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's here Canada is Sutton, Quebec. There are beautiful places all over this country. Please email us, your Canada, to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.